Good morning, everybody. Hello, and welcome to session 75 of Libraries in Response uh, with uh, Annie and Stacy. We're really happy to have these two outstanding state librarians with us today. And we'll talk about what they're going to talk about in a few minutes as uh, we go through our uh, introduction. Um, we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. My name is Don Means. And uh, GLN is an open consortium of uh, tech innovating libraries doing all kinds of interesting things. And we try to encourage those and share that work. Uh, the sessions are hosted and recorded by our longtime partner, uh, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, based in the Netherlands, with Stephen Weiber, the head of public policy for IFLA at the helm. Thank you, Stephen. All the, all the prior sessions are recorded. We get a number of uh, comments. Uh, can't make it. When will it be recorded? Yes, yes, yes. It's always recorded and archived and posted at on the pandemic response page at uh, libraries, uh, giglibraries.net. You'll find it there. Um, these images are indicative uh, of the two states. You'll have to, you'll have to match them match the image with the state uh these are some of the projects a little background about gln we we've, we've been active in uh connectivity uh and libraries that we've just become completely enamored with as this nexus of uh of community health and and culture education and uh, we 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 refer to libraries as the swiss army knife of public institutions they do more things, more different things for more people than any other public institution by far. And our, I think maybe because of that, they're not identified specifically with, you know, like schools and clinics and so forth, have a very specific narrow charter. And okay, you just judge the value of that according to that, that particular function. Uh, books, besides books, libraries are, uh, well, it's, it's hard for people to know how much they do and how many people use libraries. Roughly half of the US population are active library card holders, which is stunning to me, but happy. And um, so we've come to this through a long circuitous route of uh, projects and uh, policy priorities and advocacies uh, around connectivity principally, and then now all the various things that the libraries represent and it's a growing and constantly changing list because circumstances are changing so rapidly and dramatically but these are uh, a list of the projects and and uh, efforts we've been involved in with libraries and response being the one you're participating in today thank you very much uh it's been it's been a really interesting three years since the pandemic was declared and everybody was going, well, what's going on? I mean, uh, what does this mean? What do we do? And we posed the question, well, okay, let's start by asking the question, what is a library if the building is closed? Is the library closed? Well, no, it's online, but you know, how does that work? And, and how does it all work now? And, and so the first thing that, that was obvious to us because we've been working in connectivity was just, just take the Wi-Fi signal and, and Turn it out the window. At least people have a little better connection as they get near the building. And of course, beyond the building, which has been a lot of our work, is how to distribute this very precious resource of uh, internet access or library Wi-Fi in its, in its uh, basic form to more places and communities. Because right now, everybody has to go to the library itself to access that. We think they should be able to access that service from every neighborhood should have its own for access station uh this is what really started us on this road and it constitutes a, the recordings constitute something of an archive of what we've gone through uh if anybody wants to spend 75 hours reading and looking at these then they'll have a sense of it we're, we're thinking maybe we can feed all that uh, transcript into uh uh, an AI and have it tell us what it thinks we've been talking about for the past three years. We may try that. Uh, but COVID was totally serious and looking very lethal in the beginning, but now things are mostly better. 
but things are not all better because there are crises galore. We had a cascade of crises in 2020, starting with the health crisis, and the, the, the social crisis, the Floyd murders, the, the economic crisis, and the, the looming crisis, the, the one that really shrinks all the other ones, I'd have to say, to nearly minuscule proportion is the climate crisis. And it's it's getting heavy and just looking more dire all the time. Our question then is, okay, well, what what can libraries do about that? Well, they're not going to reduce the carbon footprint very much. Actually, mitigation is going to take huge actions by enormous players, you know, the U.S. and the Chinese governments for, for starters. Uh, if that doesn't happen, it's it's going to it's going to get rough. It's already getting rough. But adaptation being the other part of this equation is where libraries can take action. And, and uh, all these, this is an excellent little graph from uh, from British Columbia on different activities. Uh, most of those you can see they relate to libraries. And adaptation comes down to the individual level and, and definitely the community level. Uh, and Connecting, having a connectivity, a robust connectivity hub in the community is a is a really smart move. Uh, and having a library with a backup source of energy, electricity, and uh, communication. If you've ever been through an extended lights out scenario, you can appreciate what that means. If you haven't, maybe you can imagine it, but it's not like experiencing it. So enough of all that. Uh, let's get to why we're all here today, really. And that's to hear from Annie and Stacy. Uh, two librarians I personally have known for a long time and uh, admired them both. Annie's returning. Uh, she uh, was with us a couple of years ago, giving us an update. And this is a first time for Stacy, who's not only here for the first time, but as you may have figured out, 8 a.m. Pacific is about three hours later than uh, eight, uh, 5 a.m. in Hawaii, which is where Stacy's coming to us from. Stacy, thank you so much for rolling out at this hour. But we'll start with uh, with Annie uh, to tell us, Annie, what you have been uh, what you've been up to, and uh, and what you think is going on. I'm just trying to stop sharing. Did I stop sharing here? There we go. You Thank you, Steve. Ready for me to share? Let me. Yes, share. yes, Annie. Welcome back. Good to see you. Thanks so much. What What have you? You tell us. You know, of course, you're going to tell us kind of what's going on. But we really want to know what 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 you've learned through these last tumultuous thirty six, thirty seven months, whatever it is, and and then how you see that uh, guiding your library uh, the next the next three years. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Don. I I, I always enjoy working with Don. Uh, I always learn something, and it's uh, always an adventure. Uh, he first asked me about bead, uh, and then I saw the announcement for today, and it said uh, "State of the States VI," and I'm like, "Oh no! What is VI? <laughs> is, that, is that virtual intelligence?" And then I realized, "Oh no, that's six. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so right now, so this is going to be a hodgepodge, uh, a little bit of, uh, what is, uh, what we've learned for the, the last three years and the vision for the next, uh, three to five years. We're actually, uh, gearing up for the Delaware Library, um, Association Legislative Day, which is coming up. Uh, so we've been working on, um, ideas for that. So I'm sharing some insight about our uh, momentum with uh, advocacy and funding. So library advocacy, the next frontier. Uh, so it's about the power of systems and the power of consortia uh, because we're finding it's, uh, it's easier to fund a system. Uh, and our first successful strategy was speaking with one voice and next uh, the library infrastructure, the technology and the power of systems has taken us to the next level. And then the next frontier is using that system to achieve results, those outcomes at scale, uh, which will take library support to an even higher level. 
Uh, but I have some uh, caveats for this. Uh, for one thing, Delaware is a blue state uh, primarily, which helps, I, I think. And I, I'm just horrified by what libraries are, are going through throughout this, uh, the nation. And so, um, you know, I, I'm very sorry for that. Um, we have found that working as a system helps our funders to help libraries. Um, and another caveat, uh, Stacy knows I want to be Hawaii <laughs> uh, for many reasons, but mostly because her libraries are a single governance. But uh, infrastructure supports relationships. Um, you know, I, I know Stacy says it's not all it's cracked up to be, and personalities are, are an issue here too. Um, but infrastructure supports relationships. So even when, when there's turnover, the connection uh, among organizations is still in place. And the, my third ca caveat is that I know, I know Delaware is a small state, but our initiatives are borrowed from big states. So our statewide catalog, uh, for instance, was modeled after Wyoming and Georgia, um, Maine managed E-rate statewide. So it's not necessarily the size, uh, it's the strategy that counts, I think. So uh, we have a library facilities infrastructure and of note about this is uh, the shared goal of one square foot per capita. So, uh, you know, it, it's, they're all anchored around that. The state funds up to 50% of library construction. We got um, a whole boatload of uh, state ARPA funds for the match, which was helpful for uh, libraries and disadvantaged communities, especially. So we got what sixty-eight million dollars in ARPA funds or in um, total construction funds this year, and we're asking for twenty-three million for next year. And also, Energize Delaware has set aside three million dollars for libraries to add solar solutions. For the library facilities, um, uh, for the libraries' uh, technology infrastructure. We have, we have a statewide library catalog and we ended up with a statewide library network too. So be careful what you ask for. <laughs> um, they, we also fund all the technologies and support the technologies in the libraries. And the state decided it made sense to fund that infrastructure. Uh, so it funds 100% of library technologies. So uh, the Delaware Library Catalog and Consortium infrastructure makes it easier to roll out anything statewide. Uh, so such as MiFi's Chromebooks, and we did parking lot wireless really quickly during COVID. Uh, we have telehealth booths that have been piloted and more are being installed. Uh, we've got funding from healthcare organizations uh, as well as a congressional earmark for that. Uh, partner devices, too, are also easier to roll out statewide. We've got these um, blood pressure cuffs and all, you know, all kinds of stuff. And um, speaking of the climate issues, uh, DENREC, uh, or whatever it is, uh, Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control is really interested in working with us and, you know, induction stoves and all sorts of things. So we're, we're excited about that. So regarding BEAD, um, so of course libraries have supported digital literacy and equity since the 1990s, back when it was called computer skills. <laughs> um, and we did add North Star digital literacy uh, during COVID. Uh, and all of our public libraries are already at one gig. I know, wah. <laughs> uh, but we still need stuff. So we're hoping to get digital navigators for our uh, social innovation team. Of course, that's, you know, hopefully there's no hiring challenges by the time that money is available. And we're hoping to get uh, more devices uh, and maybe solar generators for emergencies. Uh, we think that might be possible. Delaware is a Shelby member, at least a lurking member. Um, we've, and we're getting all kinds of support and uh, uh, nudging. Uh, from NTIA, every library um, as well. And just recently, Roddy Flynn, who was formerly of NTIA, was just hired by DTI, our Department of Technology and Information. And he gets libraries, which is really helpful because DTI doesn't really get libraries. 
Um, and so we volunteered, uh, all of the public meetings were held at libraries uh, for them. And we're also attending all the online stakeholder presentations. And so we'll, we'll see how it turns out. <clears throat> So Delaware libraries have overwhelming support from Delaware voters. This is from an every library survey uh, last November. Uh, a single library system enables live data, which is essential to be able to answer questions at each level that were funded. The library system gives us leverage, a concrete higher level platform for influence. So an anecdote from uh, years ago when uh, we were working with the Gates Foundation, the, uh, our program officer once said to me, and this was about state librarians, she says, you're all middle managers, you know. And I thought, well, I think I've just been insulted, but I realized that it's true. I'm a middle manager in state government and county librarians are middle managers in county government and, and so on. So a system uh, is a empire for leverage, and it's easier to fund a system. Uh, and so our library standards, for instance, which um, we're, we are, um, last I looked, ninth in the nation, which is pretty good, but you know, it's never enough. Um, but it, it just hasn't kept pace with library construction, I think, because it's a pass-through, uh, which is not as popular with the the funders as um, you know, being able to fund a system. We are supposed to get $750,000 additional next year for the library infrastructure, an anticipated increase of 350,000 for eBooks. And of course, Dolly Parton's Imagination Library is fully funded. So when, when we did uh, form the catalog and they were all first integrated into one, we went, um, uh, you know, it was so popular, we went from about a third of Delawareans that had a library card to about half, which Don is what you mentioned, about half of nationally have a library card. But, and that was steady for a while for us, but it started to decline. And it seems to me that people either get libraries or they don't. And for those who get libraries, they have the library habit, but it's difficult to convince others or raise a reader for those who don't get libraries. So um, public officials who fund us want to know that libraries are involved in solving community issues. So we're just starting with our library's traditional role of literacy support, which I think also it links with ESL and digital literacy. Those things kind of um, come together. So Delaware's literacy, literacy scores are awful. Our school libraries have been in crisis for decades, and that impacts all libraries, the literacy scores, the support for libraries, and so on. So why did we finally receive funding for school libraries after all these decades? It's because it's easier to fund a system. So we got a new million dollars uh, to connect school libraries to the Delaware Library Catalog. And this was through Department of State, where I am, not through DOE. DOE does nothing for school libraries. And this is to complete the system of libraries. So it's a strategy to become more effective, efficient and effective. The so families that are library users use the public libraries. For families that aren't already library users, the next potential link and solution are the school libraries to bring the other 50% of the population on board to develop the library habit and to improve literacy. It, it connects the school librarians who have been so isolated and it further builds and finalizes that library empire, the library system. And these are examples of of outdated books that we just removed in 2019, right before COVID. And if we want families to become library users, they need to see themselves in the collections. Of course, we need equitable access to updated and diverse collections. So we have a Delaware Communities of Excellence initiative, uh, uh, which started during COVID and they're conducting an equity through literacy initiative, which includes all kinds of literacies, including environmental literacy and and so on. So some of these literacy partners get libraries and some do not. 
The ones who don't, their work inter inadvertently undermines the libraries. This is a, a lean literacy map, which is organized by um, age groupings and also assessment, skill development, and book access. So using capacity and stretch targets based on total population helps keep an eye on effectiveness. And just an example from our pilot, which is the Colonial School District, uh, in March 2023, less than half of the colonial students checked out any books, print or ebooks, uh, at all during that month. So my uh, suggested goal is that every Delaware student check out a minimum of two books per week during the school year, which of course is a stretch target. But it, and if every Delawarean becomes a reader, we'll need a lot more books. Once school libraries are connected, we can make the argument for funding for shared collections across the Delaware Library Consortium. So our initial reasons for the consortium were typical, um, getting live data, economy of scale savings, um, that sort of thing. But we're finding that there's even more potential emerging from this. Uh, there's great power in library consortia that we haven't even begun to tap. And so let's study consortia and let's connect them uh, across the nation. Let's do. <laughs> That's beautiful, Annie. Uh, you mentioned you learn from me. I learn much more listening to you every time you delineate your approach and your experiences. This is this is a beautiful presentation, just loaded with interesting stuff. Uh, can we go a little deeper into the systems concept? So I hear that as you know uh, a scale concept. Okay, it's it's a it's the size of a of an initiative, and and I want to spend my time supporting things that make a difference. So if it's a bigger thing, that it's probably if it works, it'll make a bigger difference. What how, how do you define the systems again? Can you explain that approach a little more? Well, the system, to me, the system, it's a technology system, uh, primarily, it's being connected. And I and it ultimately, I think not only uh, should all the libraries be connected, uh, we really need to be connected with our partners so that we're all working together more seamlessly. Otherwise, it's like endless meetings where we're all meeting and we're, we talk about the same thing every time, but, you know, it's not as effective unless we're in the same system. Uh, we are um, have, are participating in Unite Delaware, which uh, you know Unite uh, Us is a um, is a organization that kind of brings uh, organizations together into one software. But it reminds me of the whole Z thirty nine dot fifty, you know, the the union catalogs that were kind of overlays for library catalogs. And it, to me, that that's just an extra thing, and it doesn't. You're not in bed together so you can actually work together and see what's happening. So when we were bringing together our catalog, some of some of the libraries wanted to do that Z39.50 thing. And I'm like, no, <laughs> we want one catalog so that we're all working together. And that I think that's a drawback of Unite Delaware. They have not, uh, that software is an overlay. And um, until we can work uh, seamlessly with um, all the partners on one project. That's what we need to be most effective. I think for libraries, as I said, uh, we need to be connected. We need to have live data, live data at all levels that were funded. And that includes the national level. Um, right now, our you know, data is two years old. Um, and, and you know, perhaps we could use uh, blockchain or something like that so that we're all connected and that there's live data that, that, to tell the story of what's happening. Okay, so it's, that sounds like a, kind of a multiple definition of systems, both the physical connections and the organizational connections and the, the underpinning of the, uh, of the resources. Or the, is that a, a system of systems kind of a thing you're describing? <laughs> and and do politicians get that concept? Your funders, I'm I'm short for funders. Well, they know that the, they they definitely know that we have the statewide Delaware Library catalog because uh, the, the the public loves it. 
because you know even a small state like Delaware when we started we had four separate public library catalogs and so um, you know the the people who lived at the top of the state would go to the beaches at the bottom of the state but their library cards didn't work there you know and so now wherever you work or live in Delaware you can use a library so they absolutely know that and um, so that's a big one yeah uh, you touched on uh, telehealth booths. Did you describe them? Little compartments for privacy and interactivity and blood pressure check, or tell us a little bit about how those function. Yeah, so uh, Nick, these were uh, Nick Martin is the lead on that. He was uh, originally an AmeriCorps Vista for us, and that was his. Uh, that was the project that he developed, and then uh, he is, is currently a, a consultant for us, although he's I'm going to be moving on to bigger and better things. Um, so it, it is, they are telehealth boosts, but we actually also call them teleservices boosts because you can use mm -hmm. them for either medical appointments or job interviews or um, a meeting with an attorney. It's, it's really a, um, a private space. Uh, but he's working with the health organizations and with the primary focus on mental health services. Um, it's simply because of, it's a good place to start because you don't need a whole lot of additional devices <laughs> with that um, to, to do that. Uh, the blood pressure cuffs, which you saw, I mean, that's part of our library of things. Uh, and so we check those out um, uh, to others. Those are popular. It sounds popular. Yeah, we had we had Nick on a couple of years ago. It, it was yeah. a great presentation. Yeah, um, and and it seemed like you know one more example of a new thing that libraries take on because there's well, a need. It, so yeah. here's my here's my thought about it though, which you know things come around again. I mean. And it's true of some of our libraries too. I mean, many libraries have a lot of small meeting rooms, you know, the tiny little two person meeting room. And really all they need to do is to make sure they're soundproof. Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of cool to have a separate little booth uh, like, like they do in the airports and such, um, but it's really, it, it's for the, kind of for the gimmicky. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think the connecting with the services, like the, with the health care organizations to have the telehealth appointments, I mean, that's that's the real important piece of it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds like uh, another layer of system. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it just hit me that, uh, that the president of the United States is from Delaware. I mean, uh, absolutely. As I said, we're very blue. <laughs> we're a blue Everybody. state. <laughs> My question is, when was the last time Joe Biden walked into a public library? So, well, I don't know, but I did see him. Uh, this was this is a while ago. This was at the opening of the Woodlawn Library. He was uh, at that opening, uh, but that yeah, that was been quite a while ago. Uh, his wife, uh, Dr. Biden, was at the Dover Public Library. That's when she was uh, releasing her children's book. Um, and of course, I'd met um, Bo Biden a couple times. Uh, he was a wonderful person. I'd, I'd never have met Hunter. I did meet the, uh, the sister one time, uh, uh, Biden's sister. That's when Senator, well, now Senator Coons, when he was fundraising. Um, so yeah, it's it is a small it's, state. It's and... always been right, but it's always been fascinating to me of all the many images we have of a president sitting in a schoolroom reading to students. How many images do we have a president in a library? You know, browsing the shelves or anything at all like that. It's just it's such an. I don't mean to be political about this, but it just seems like it's such a missed opportunity because they're so popular. Well, why well, wouldn't they use school you do libraries that? a lot? There's a lot of uh, you yeah. know photo ops yeah. in school libraries, even if that school library has no budget. <laughs> <laughs> even so, uh, but it's identified as a school, you know, and it's just a room in a school. And so anyway, it's just a long-standing 
strange thing for me uh, that that hasn't gotten more. I mean, every other kind of venue you can think of, you've seen somebody show up to shake hands and be a you know a peer. Uh, it's just a missed bet. So we're going to use that as a segue because uh, there's another president who also has a favorite state, uh, maybe almost a home state, and that, of course, is Hawaii, where uh, where uh, Obama would, uh, where he grew up and, and where he vacations. Maybe that is his home state. So here we have uh, Stacy. Aldrich. For the first time, Stacy, I'm so happy to have you, as I said, happy to have you get up uh, this early and talk to us about, about uh, your libraries. I'll, I'll get, I'll return to, when we get to the open quiz, I'll return to this uh, question about BEAD and the, the federal grants and so forth, and we'll, we'll talk about connectivity uh, across the states, which there's a lot of commonality that Hawaii and Delaware have in terms of connecting their libraries. But uh, thank you for uh, coming, and please tell us what's happening with your libraries. Aloha and good morning, Don. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share my mana'o, which is your first Hawaiian word today, everyone. Mana'o means your your thoughts, your what you're thinking, um, and uh, uh, to, to share what's going on here in Hawaii. Um, I want to thank Annie. She's always doing really awesome things, so I always love hearing about what she's working on, and we are working on very similar things. Um, and I know, uh, so just a little bit of context, uh, Hawaii is a single statewide public library system. Um, we report to the Board of Education, but we are not a part of the, the Department of Education, which continues to confuse people here um, in the state, but we uh, we don't, we're not a part of uh, the, the DOE. Um, we have 51 branches on six islands. Um, and that creates all kinds of fun opportunities um, being so spread out. Um, but we are very efficient as a system. So uh, more like any large uh, public library system on the mainland, except we can't drive to the branches. Um, I think I just wanted to share um, uh, just some things I've been thinking about, and I'm sure a lot of you have been um, feeling the same way or have had the same opportunities, but it's nice to have an opportunity to kind of put it out there. So for us, um, it was um, for the past couple of years, it has been COVID, volcanoes, hurricanes, and changes every 37 minutes, oh my. And as I think about what we've gone through over the last couple of years, um, there's some things that I think um, I reflect on that you kind of know, but you don't know till you actually experience it. Um, the first is that I think the crisis of all these crises, crises that we've been experiencing um, they always create opportunities for innovation, and it feels like in libraries sometimes we really get stuck and it's hard to make some shifts, but during COVID we were able to make more shifts because we had to. So we had to figure out new ways to provide services, we had to figure out pretty quickly, and, and we all moved with that. Um, but making just simple changes every day and kind of moving forward innovation can sometimes be a challenge for us. So I don't know if we need to have crises to make innovation, but it definitely we used as an opportunity to do things that we hadn't done here in Hawaii. So we um, we were able to implement a new app that people can do self-checkout on. Um, we were able to launch pretty quickly an online pickup system where people could make reservations and get information to people. So I think at the same time, we talk about how it takes us time to change, but libraries are really adaptable and I'm really grateful to the wonderful staff that I get to work with every day. I think um, the second thing I learned was um, saying yes can be a blessing and a curse. So our libraries, we were closed for um, more than a month. Um, the whole state was shut down. And um, once the state began to open up, we were back up online in May. We didn't have full library services, but we did bring, um, we did have, you know, door services and um, we were doing virtual programming. We we're trying to do all the things that everybody else was was doing to ensure our communities were connected. At the same time, we were um, partnering with as many agencies as we could to um, help provide services to people. So our, uh, our uh, unemployment, um, de the department that deals with unemployment just got completely overloaded and was not able to, um, they, they did not have the staff to 
to meet the challenges. So we stepped up and we were able to provide staffing um, in order to help um, while we were still closed to the public. So we, we had offered up our staff and some of our technology and our librarians were so good at it. They started giving them higher level duties. And I was like, no, you cannot have our staff too. <laughs> but we were, we looked for ways to um, help our, our colleagues to help our public. Um, and we also were able to be a part of what is our statewide, it's called um, Broadband HUI. A HUI is a group. Um, and that group met during the whole pandemic and it was led by um, who, uh, Bert Lum, who is our broadband um, guru here in the state and uh, in charge of digital equity. And he led these meetings and everybody was on them. So anybody from um, government to vendors, to schools, to private, um, to government. Um, we had our um, speaker of the um, Senate, our president of the Senate on these meetings, talking about how do we get people connected? How do we take advantage of all the opportunities that were um, being presented from the federal level? And um, from the beginning, Bert saw the libraries as being a crucial part of digital literacy, which I was so excited. I <laughs> Sometimes I would jest and say, oh, it's so cute that you think you know, libraries can be this new hub for digital literacy when we've been doing this since the 1990s. Um, but that, that relationship, that partnership, that being available and seeing everybody in one place created lots of opportunities for us to make offers for leadership. And so um, we, uh, I was tapped by the governor's office to pursue a National Governors Association grant to um, build a plan for uh, digital literacy upskilling, digital literacy for the workforce. And so I had 24 hours to write it <laughs> and develop it. And then we worked with um, a, a team of people from the Broadband Hui and the governor's office to um, build this plan, which is now being used to um, write our digital, our digital equity plan for, for BEAD. So we were laying the, the foundations for, um, for what we're actually writing in our in our um, upcoming statewide um, digital equity plan. Um, we also had an opportunity to meet other people. So, you know, by making an offer for leadership, other people notice you. Um, we had we got noticed by a few other people who said, hey, we want to figure out how we can also look at libraries. And, and we had a plan. We kept saying libraries are a hub. Libraries are a space where everybody has access. We want to keep creating these opportunities for people. And in a work from a workforce sense, how do we create future opportunities for the younger generations to think about what's possible? So we were connected with a group called True, the True Initiative. Um, it's um, the large companies here trying to figure out how to um, develop workforce, but also how to use technology in an efficient way. And they worked with us to create our first esports lab in um, our Waipahu Library, which has been uh, very, very popular in the community. It's, you know, if you want to get into gaming, which in gaming, there's so many opportunities. You can become a programmer, you can become a, a promoter, you can become a player. Um, and um, they, they saw this, the library as a place that we could create that opportunity. And so um, they helped us to build this new lab and it brought a lot of attention to the fact that libraries are these community spaces that can offer opportunities to the community where they might not have the access or the technology to do things at home, but there is a place that they can um, have these opportunities. So um, I think that making the off offer, just making an offer to do something has created all kinds of partnerships and opportunities for us to grow services that make sense for our communities. Um, the other thing that um, has been interesting, I'm sure you've all thought about this with the whole um, book manning, it's uh, different in every, you know, every state. And we are um, very pretty liberal here in Hawaii, but um, we still have people who are connected to the mainland and following all kinds of um, list serves and, um, and we still have people here who want to censor books. And um, it's all for all the same reasons, we're seeing the exact same things happening on the mainland. So it's not new. We've all been through this before. In the 80s, there were huge um, initiatives to, to ban um, materials in libraries and to censor materials in libraries. 
I think the question for us, and it's not only just with the books, and all, but it's also with the pandemic, is when we see history repeating itself, what are the factors that are changing the impact or the severity of what's happening to us? So when I think about um, the book challenges, when they were happening in the 80s, we didn't have social media, we didn't have 24-hour news, um, we didn't have the same connections that we do to information and misinformation. And I think that has made a huge difference in the way that um, we're seeing how um, different trends or I would say fads um, spread. And so watching that and thinking about that, something that I continue to look at, like what is, history does repeat itself and humans pretty much act the same way usually. <laughs> But there are some things I think that really are impacting how we move move forward. So we're thinking about that. And as I look at the future, you know, it's really hard. I, I kind of, you know, I've done a lot of futuring work before and the pandemic was really interesting because you had to kind of be in the moment all the time and living on the islands, you do get a different perspective about being present. Um, but I feel like I'm not sure, depends on how the election goes, <laughs> how, Things are going to be in the future. <laughs> um, but I think for us, as we look at the future here, we, we are in the process of doing a strategic plan. And we put a survey out to our uh, patrons and we got 18,000 responses, which is huge. <laughs> I mean, we're lucky if we get maybe like 1,000, 3,000 when we do a survey, but 18,000 responses. And our communities are very... Um, uh, the response that we got, we, we put up some things like these are things we could do. What would you like, you know, do you have any ideas about what we could be doing? Um, and very traditional literacy, huge supporting kids in school and literacy. Um, of course, um, making sure they have technology skills. So digital literacy. Um, but one of the things that came out very clearly is we, we, we had an option that the library would be a hub where you could connect to government and any kind of agency. And that got a lot of um, positive feedback. So we're really looking at how can we continue to partner with other agencies to be that place for people to connect not only virtually or digitally, but also physically with people. Um, we do have some very remote places like your rural areas um, on the mainland. And um, it takes a while for people to get from one location to another. And even though our islands are not huge, um, even um, where Don is right now on the big island, it takes a long time to go <laughs> just a short way because we only have like single roads and um, with the speed limits and the, the roads, it's, it takes a while and, and people don't always have transportation. So um, with that, we've already been partnering um, on a telehealth project with the Department of Health and also with the Pacific Basin um, Telehealth Center from the University of Hawaii. We're working um, to develop not only places where people can check out resources, a hotspot and a Chromebook to take home and, and use that if they need to have some ongoing visits with their doctor, but um, we're in the stages of developing these telehealth navigators to help people manage moving from um, through how to connect to their, um, their providers. So um, I think there's all these opportunities for us to continue to be this hub that makes collections of people, of things, and also a place where our communities can continue to connect to each other. And so um, I think we, we look at all those things and we've, we know that we have support from the legislature. We just have to help them figure out how to actually fund us in a way <clears throat> that will help us do all those things. Um, and um, to understand the, the challenges that are faced. I, I really would love to see, I have to just sit down and do it someday, a graphic that shows people what it costs to run a library system in 1980 and what it costs to run a library system today, because it's so vastly different in a world where we don't own content, but we are leasing content and so and buying so many different formats. So I think there's so many more discussions to have, and I think I'll just stop there. On. Um, I'm curious about what other people are thinking about right now. Well, so am I, uh, Stacy. That's great. And uh, thank you for giving me away. But uh, I am, in fact, uh, <laughs> on the big island here in Hawaii, working from Hawaii as not, not a moment, but you know, 
uh, but the connectivity allows us. It's wonderful. I mean, look, we're so scattered out just uh, right here, you know, with Stephen in the Netherlands and you and me in Hawaii and Annie on the East Coast. It's just it's stunning that this is this technology is so simple now that we can do this kind of a thing. Uh, you, uh, you touched on gaming and that gets to, uh, broadband, which I know you've done a lot of work with. Just tell us a little bit. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to Annie with the same kind of question about what's the status of your, uh, internet connections among all the libraries and, you know, how did it come about and, and what does it need still? Sure. Uh, um, excuse me. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, so we, um, when I first arrived, I've been here eight years, we were connected to INET, which is a, a statewide network um, that was built um, with the first broadband money that came out to the, the various states. So we had an INET loop that we were connected to um, and for, for our, our branches. And then for each branch as a backup, we would just, we had, we were paying bills for whatever we could get. So it could be a T1 line, it could be, it could be a, um, a, well, felt like dial up, frankly. So we had some areas that really just didn't have any, didn't have really good connectivity at all. So um, we were able to, um, the Department of Ed was great and they pulled us in when they applied for E-rate funding during the pandemic. And so we finally applied for E-rate. And so now we have, um, we are, almost all of our branches, I think we have a handful that are not done yet, building a one gig burstable to every branch. So every branch will have a fast con connection um, of their own. And then we're using INET for staff and a failover. And um, so when one network goes down or if one network goes down, it's gonna flop over to the, the next network to make it easy for the connectivity to continue um, for the public. Because when things would go down, in our branches before, it could take a while to get them back up. And we wanna make sure that everybody has that connectivity. So um, we're really grateful for E-Rate and we're using that to just keep building the pipe. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a special challenge to uh, run uh, fiber lines among the islands and then around the islands, which are their own special challenges. The apology here is so challenging. Um, Annie, you, you've had all of your, uh, libraries, uh, with, uh, fiber for a number of years now, what, and, and getting back to the bead question, which is the kind of context for all this federal money that's, you know, out there to connect everybody and, and the planning requirements that the state governments have to go after any of that. That was kind of one of the questions are, are you involved in that or, and how are you involved in that? And. And what's what's doing with broadband for you? Well, yeah. So, um, yeah, as I said, all our public libraries are already at one gig, and you know, so we we're kind of <laughs> disappointed to find out. Well, that was you know what's what's recommended, but we're still hoping that we can get funds for digital navigators and and maybe um, uh, emerge uh, solar generators for emergency. Uh, but yeah, we're trying to. Uh, be as helpful and as involved as possible and are attending all the stakeholder meetings. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, I, I, I think we may get something, but the, of course the priority is to connect all the households first and Delaware has a really high connectivity rate already. Um, so maybe there'll be something left, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh... So one, one thing that struck me, you mentioned middle management. Uh, uh, that was you, Stacey, right? Middle management, or is that Annie? Annie. Yeah. Annie, middle management. So that's generally true in government, you know, unless you're kind of the head of the government. Uh, but at the same time, don't libraries have kind of a special status a little bit outside of this kind of vertical line? They have a... a, a exemption from being sort of normal agencies we can't just jerk them around or is that just a local library thing well it depends on the state you know that's uh set up differently uh in in some state some in, in some states the state library agency is under 
Department of Education. In my state, it's under Department of State. Um, and, and some are independent. They're uh, separate altogether. But, um, you know, uh, for those of us, I think, who are in either DOE or Department of State, we're middle managers. Um, okay. Yeah. I would say really? though, that we're, we're flexible though. I mean, you can be really flexible because we're usually small in most states and I've been state librarian in <clears throat> two other states, can't keep a job currently. <laughs> and I worked <laughs> in Maryland. <laughs> and um, um, I think the reason why people can come to us is because we can be a little more flexible and because we we're, our minds are more adaptable. And I think that's the power of the libraries. Even in your communities, if you're the person who can say yes, or hmm, let's, yes, and let's figure out how we do that. I, I find that our flexibility is our, is our uh, superpower here, because well, um, we, we are small. Well, mm -hmm. you know, if we can fly below the radar, because we're not <laughs> getting as much attention sometimes. Mm -hmm. That but, used but to I be the that's case. Been, right? that, that's been my, you know, I'm a librarian first, but I'm a career bureaucrat, you know, so my job is trying to get stuff done in spite of bureaucracy. <laughs> that used to be uh, a strategy below the radar, but also you want to have more, a higher profile. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the kind of right. a dance between the two. Uh, uh, but you were part of a large system, Stacey. You were a deputy in California. I mean, doesn't get much bigger than that, does it? It was big. But yeah. one of the we, one, excuse me. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about in that office uh, when Susan Hildreth was the director there uh, know, 15 years ago was this role that you touched on related to uh, 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 e government or, yeah, effectively e government. And this seemed like a, a natural role. So every agency at every level of government is spawning these applications, right? EGOV, save money, make it more convenient, productive and all that. Besides the point of who exactly are those services for people that are connected and what about who are not connected? Oh, well, uh, yeah, they can go to the library. Okay, did you save any, did you share any of the savings with the library for taking on that additional? Well, no, why not? Well, we didn't have to. Well, okay, great, thanks a lot. But the point is uh, that that those, the development of those, of those uh, applications is a very highly specific kind of activity that's designed, interface and all that. And wouldn't that make a natural partnership with libraries? Librarians who have more experience helping people interact with those very programs and probably anybody else, wouldn't they be perfect partners in the development? No, you should not put it that way. People won't understand. We'll get all these questions about it. Wouldn't they be a good quality partner in development of EGOV? And has anybody ever asked you about that or have you even offered to do any of that? Uh, we have offered, Stacey, we've offered, we have uh, offered to do it. We've offered to yeah. do it. We, we had an experience where one of the departments uh, wanted to have a big meeting with us. So we had our virtual meeting and they said, and this was sort of middle pandemic. And they said, would it be okay if we, you know, promote libraries as a place that people can go to get assistance from us? And we were like, well, of course, you know, you have these online forms. And we said, and are you going to send out some staff to also be there to help them with these forms or to work them through whatever challenges they have. And they, they said, no, it's too dangerous. It's COVID right now. And so we were like, so libraries, our staff are like the sacrificial lambs. And they're like, oh, no, no, we don't mean that. Um, so we said to them, said, you know, you're, what you're asking us to do is to be your technical support. And oh, by the way, um, your websites aren't always great. And so we, not only is the person who's coming in, the librarian is taking on the role of having to take the anger and the angst of that person who is already stressed out and now they're dealing with a crappy website. And so we, we said straight up, we said, you know, when you're developing your websites, can you talk with us? We, we can be your testers because we can tell you, you know, what's, what the, the challenges are. Um, I don't know that we were successful with that group, but I'm going to keep pushing on that. And um, most of our government agencies, we use the same uh, website developer right now. 
And I, I think I might need to take a different, uh, a different uh, strategy of maybe trying to get with a web developer. Um, but absolutely, our libraries are the ones who understand what does work and what doesn't. And um, I think when we talk about partnerships, I, I always say it's a blessing and a curse because we're happy to be partners with people, but there has to be an actual partnership, not just like here, we're just gonna give you more of what we're doing because we don't have as many resources. <laughs> it's like, no, we all have to bring something to the table. So I totally agree with you, Don. As, as these, uh, all these agencies, of course, are slimming down as a result. And so, you know, they used to have people that would do that kind of thing. Or, you know, you can't, you go into an agency now and they send you over to the kiosk in the lobby to, you know, yeah. ask them the question online. Uh, but uh, uh, it, doesn't it seem like it would make sense to knock on the door of the state CIO and have this conversation one-on-one? -on -one? Annie, do you do that? Well, so in, in Delaware, uh, of course, e-government e was a, a new thing or uh, up and coming thing, I guess it was in the 1990s. And so the state librarian at the time uh, realized that and actually requested a position for e-government. <clears throat> and so it started in the state library agency, but apparently there was some sort of drama between that state librarian and the secretary of state who then took that position and created an office, uh, it's called uh, the Government Information Center. So they are the ones that handle all of these uh, applications and, um, and, and, so, and they're separate from DTI because, you know, DTI, uh, you know, it's a, the difference because um, uh, DTI, that they're about security and locking everything down. And, um, and of course, the Government Information Center and libraries were more about access. <laughs> People need access. So um, it, it, it is good that it's separate, but they, I, frankly, I, I'm glad I don't have to do the day-to-day -day uh, working with uh, DTI. Uh, but um, well, and then and then, of course, uh, you know, all this started have, like the the uh, state job applications were online, and all these things were online. And then the libraries were complaining. It's like, oh, you know, you're having us do all this stuff, but you're not giving us any more money because the you know the library standards money never increases fast enough for them. Um, <clears throat> and you know, but I tried to explain to them that is you know that's that's not your talking point you know <laughs> that doesn't doesn't work it's not positive we were one thing i'm really proud of and kind of wish we could continue it is um during covid when uh, the department of health and social services reached out to us about handing out covid test kits um, we were successful in getting them. They they provided ten thousand dollars per library for distributing uh, those uh, test kits, and I mean they went like hotcakes. So it was like a month's worth of work, right? <laughs> they had ten thousand dollars each for that, and um, that was awesome. But that physician who was at DH isn't there anymore. I don't know <laughs> what happened, but um, you know I I just thought that was like kind of breaking the ice to get uh, partners uh, and other government and, or wherever to realize that, you know, there's a cost to libraries for doing, for supporting your initiatives. Um, so if we could have more of that where they're actually contributing, that would be great. It just seems like there's no political cost uh, to just asking libraries to do it because they always say yes. And so, sure, it's the easy, easy way to kind of hand it off uh but it seems like it should be part of the uh, of the message is all these responsibilities that are being transferred shifted over onto libraries the schools closing school libraries well where the kid oh go to the public library oh, yeah. uh but it's not factored in anywhere uh to the to the budgets and the, and the staffing um so it's difficult as Stacy was just making the point to predict what's going to happen. I think we opened it to, you know, there's a, uh, these agencies all uh, operate in a, in a uh, political environment because that's who runs our government. And uh, so the elections change the policy priorities and, 
and we just don't know what's going to happen. Now we have totally discovered we have no clue what is going to happen in elections, uh, but we still have to plan. So what's your, we'll use this as kind of a, a kind of a closing uh, uh, proposition. How, how do you plan kind of the unplannable, uh, Annie? Uh, you, you just, you, you're going to do the right thing, you know, and then however the chips are going to fall, they'll fall, but you know what you want to do and you're going to try to do that. Is that pretty much it? So, well, as, as I said, I, you know, we're a blue state and uh, we've been, in, it's, you know, we've had uh, momentum over time and been building this and, you know, I don't take it for granted. I know it could go away in an instant. And uh, of course, you know, great recession hit us uh, hard uh, suddenly. Um, I think that part of this strategy, at, you know, at least for uh, normal conservatives, <laughs> I don't know how to say this politically correct, but uh, it's the fact that we are, uh, it's the efficiency of it, the efficiency and effectiveness of our approach uh, so that, you, you know, there's not um, uh, duplication of effort or waste, you know, th that that is seen as a positive. Uh, and, you know, so we're doing things effectively, but it's helping uh, people in need is, is, you know, so I think in my mind, it's trying to like serve all, um, serve both parties and, and all the ends. And hopefully that'll serve us well, as long as they're not crazy. <laughs> ah, the caveat. Stacy, what's your strategy? Well, I think, uh, first, I think we have to have a strong, um, sense of who we are and what we do. We know that. And then um, I, I think we have to be able to translate. So, so, so there, I guess there's three things. One, knowing who we are and what our responsibilities are, or here we'd say kuleana. What's our kuleana? Like, what is our role, our, our deep responsibility of the community? Two, it's being able to translate <laughs> to different people with the words that work with them. So that's always the hard part is the being able to speak be able to tell your story in the way that the different parties can hear what it is that you're um, you're doing and why it's important. So, um, and and being able to keep up with the changing the changing uh, languages because they have changed recently. I don't. I think before I understood um, I understood more, but now you really have to keep up. It's maybe not just a whole party of people but it's like each individual you have to be able to translate uh, in the way that they think what your responsibility is and I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge for us and then the third is building scenarios actually taking time we, we do that sometimes with our uh, executive team we'll play things out we'll say well if this happens what are the intended or unintended consequences and think about well, what would that mean so it I think it's also just spending some time thinking about it. And I, I think we all, it would be good for us all to spend time talking about the what ifs and thinking about what's possible so we can find some good strategies for dealing with whatever the future is going to hand us um, in the next three to five years. Great, well, I think you've just outlined our whole strategy here for these sessions is trying to develop a, a language uh for systems as annie was talking about so that people really understand it and 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 know what they're hearing this this whole communication challenge is right it's highly dynamic and there's so many perspectives and they're all all louder than ever and it's a real challenge so if there's any two people i know of that look feel like they're up to that challenge is you two and it's just been a great hour to spend with you and this is going to be a, a popular recording, I'm sure, because it's just loaded with useful insights and information, experiences, and anecdotes, and data, all of the stuff that is effective and, and getting messages across. So thank you so much for, for being here and please come back again. And uh, so with that, uh, we will thank you and we will sign off until next time. So thank you again. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you, Don. Aloha. Thanks, Stacey.